Good evening, I'm Carolyn Rye, Chair of the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach, and I hereby call this meeting to order at 6 o'clock p.m. on this 11th day of May 2021. Pursuant to the state of re emergency related to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Governor's Executive Orders, the Virginia Freedom of Information Act as amended by the Virginia General Assembly and the School Board's April 7, 2020 emergency resolution. This workshop, oh, this meeting of the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach will be conducted in person for school board members and certain staff members. However, due to the necessary health mitigations in place, it's impractical and unfeasible for the public to attend this meeting in person. Members of the public will be able to observe the school board meeting through live streaming on vbschools.com, broadcast on VBTV channel 47, and on Zoom. Madam Clerk, would you please take the verbal roll? Thank you, Madam Chair. Present in school board chambers are Chairwoman Rye, Ms. Melnick, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Felton, Ms. Franklin, Ms. Hughes, Ms. Owens, Ms. Riggs, and Ms. Weems. Attending via Zoom within the building is Ms. Holtz for health reasons and Ms. Manning for health reasons. Thank you. Would, would everyone present uh, please join me now in a moment of silence. And please stand as you are able for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, this brings us to our Student Employee and Public Awards and Recognitions. I'll turn the program over to Mrs. Melnick. Tonight, we as a board have the pleasure of recognizing division students, staff, and teams who have been awarded or recognized during state, multi-state, or national competitions or events. With that in mind, we are pleased to announce the school board recognition recipients for May 11th, 2021. Am I on? All right. We begin our recognitions by congratulating the Tallwood High School girls indoor track and field team on their first place state championship win in the girls four by 400 meter relay. The four person team is made up of senior Amaya Barnes, senior Desiree Conklin, sophomore Ariel Fletcher, and senior Zamia Stelly. The team of four athletes won first place against 11 other teams in the girls four by 400 with the second team the second place team behind them by almost three seconds. The girls were all highly valued members of the team and each individual contributed to earning the championship. In addition to the team win, Zamia came in second in the 55 meter hurdle and Desiree in fourth. These talented students have represented their school and community with grace and professionalism and, and all are prime examples of model sportsmanship. We are excited for this win and couldn't be more honored to recognize these students on this accomplishment. Next up, we have the second Tallwood High School girls, school girl indoor track and field first place state championship win by the girls on the four by 200 medley relay team. These four students athletes Senior Desiree Coughlin, sophomore Ariel Fletcher, senior Suraya uh, Johns, and senior Sumaya Stella combined their talents to finish first in the state. The team relied on their talent, training, and determination to win this title and beat out 11 other competitors. They surpassed the second place team by more than four seconds. This win cannot have happened without the commitment, 
to these others and the team. Congratulations on an amazing job. Well done. Each year, the Virginia Beach chapter of the Virginia State Literacy Association recognizes one leader as the James D. Mullins Leadership Reading Administrator of the Year. This award is given to an administrator who demonstrates true commitment to providing effective literacy instruction and who goes above and beyond to ensure teachers and students have access to high quality literacy resources. VBCPS Elementary Language Arts Coordinator Abigail Doughty received this award at the local level and we are now pleased to announce that she is the 2021 James D. Mullins Leadership Reading Administrator of the Year for the entire state of Virginia. Ms. Doughty, I guess it's Doughty's or Daugherty? Daugherty? Okay. Ms. Daugherty's dedication to developing a research-based curriculum and resources for literacy instruction her leadership in coaching, our divisions reading specialists and literacy coaches, and her leadership in developing professional learning for teachers, teacher assistants, instructional coaches, and school administrators in the area of literacy have been extraordinary. Congra congratulations, Mrs. Daugherty. Next, we have an outstanding staff accomplishment. According to the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards, the National Board Certified Teacher Certification is considered to be the most respected professional certification in K-12 education. And it takes anywhere from three to five years to complete. Now, Virginia Beach City Public Schools proudly adds 12 more division teachers to the group of educators who have achieved this certification. These 12 additional honorees bring the division's total of National Board Certified Teachers <clears throat> to 167, the fifth highest in Virginia. What makes this certification unique is that it was created by teachers for what accomplished educators should know and be able to do. In order to achieve certification, Candidates are required to demonstrate their mastery of content knowledge, provide a portfolio demonstrating how they differentiate instruction based on student needs, provide videos of their teaching in action, and submit a portfolio demonstrating evidence that they are effective and reflective practitioners. Congratulations to the division's most recent honorees Colin Bridges, a junior at Frank W. Cox High School, Colin capped an undefeated wrestling season for the Cox Falcons with both regional and state wrestling championship wins. This state title ended a seven-year drought for, the, for Cox wrestling as it is the first since 2014. Colin took first place for VHSL's class five, 152 pound weight class. Colin is a Cox High School wrestling standout and after a fifth place state finish last year, he was determined to get the first place win. As one of the captains, he helped lead his team to a fourth place state finish. I've known Colin and watched him compete since middle school. And not only is he an incredible wrestler, but an also, also an amazing young man. Colin is described as dedicated, dependable, and hardworking. The sky is truly the limit for him. Congratulations, Colin. We look forward to seeing what you accomplish next year at Cox and in your future. No quit. I have the honor of recognizing Rashard R.J. Jeffries, a senior from Frank W. Cox High School. Rashard is not only a valued member of the indoor track and field team and a gifted jumper in track, but he is also tremendously a tremendously caring human being. Rashard is a two-time regional champion in the triple jump in both the 2020 and the 2021 indoor track seasons as well as the current class five indoor track and field triple jump state champion. To win this honor, he jumped an astonishing distance of 45 feet and five and one quarter inch. In addition, 
He is a team captain and a true leader for the entire Cox track and field team, as well as a student athlete who inspires the teammates to work each day and every day to reach their dreams and be the very best. His accomplishments this year are due to his talent and his desire to work hard and better himself each and every day. Congratulations, Rashard R.J. Jeffries. We can't wait to see what amazing things you will accomplish in your future. Up next, your amazing and amazing accomplishment from another Cox High School senior, Maggie Dominic. Maggie has been a dominating force for the Cox Falcons girls swimming and diving team since her freshman year. Maggie shines as a natural sprinter in the water and excels in the 50-meter and 100-meter freestyle events. To round out her senior year swimming for the Falcons, Maggie placed first and won the swimming state championship for the 100-yard freestyle. Maggie is also extremely versatile in the water and competes alongside a relay team and showcases an amazing ability to compete in any event that helps her team succeed. Maggie is a strong, intelligent young woman that is poised to be a bright star, both in her academic future and swimming career. Maggie plans to attend the University of Cincinnati in the fall, where she will swim and hopes to major in business management. Congratulations, Maggie. Rounding out our recognitions for tonight is the Frank W. Cox High School Girls Swimming and Diving Team, Cox Girls Falcons 200-meter relay medley relay team is a shining example of teamwork, which led this group to a state championship win for the 200 meter medley relay. The medley relay team is made up of four athletes, Alexa Osmond, Samantha, Sam Bucklew, Spencer Worth, and Maggie Dominic. Alexa Osmond, a sophomore, is a national ranked backstroker who performed exceptionally well under the pressure of leading off a relay at the state level. Sam Bucklew, a senior, is a natural breaststroker who kept setting personal best during her senior season, allowing her to pull ahead of the competition during the state race. Spencer Worth, a junior, is an aggressive butterflyer who doesn't back down from a challenge, which allowed her to maintain the relay's lead. And last but not least, Maggie Dominic, a senior, brought her untouchable sprinter ability to the freestyle anchor position, which solidified the relay's first place state finish. Congratulations to this amazing team and the coaches on a job well done. This concludes the rec sorry. This concludes the recognitions for this meeting. Again, congratulations to everyone who is recognized this evening. Thank you all and and Congratulations to all our amazing students and staff. Adoption of the agenda. Uh, modification, I have one to offer. Uh, and I did uh, reach out previously via email to you all. I'll be uh, proposing that tonight's agenda be amended to include action item C, to add an action item, which would be 12C on adding adjusted dismissals for graduations to the school calendar. Uh, and as conveyed by staff, June 15th, 16th, and 17th will be adjusted school days for high school students only in support of scheduled graduations at the amphitheater. High school students will be dismissed at 11.35 a.m. Also, the last day for high school students attending the Advanced Technology Center and Technical Education Center will be Friday, June 11th. There'll be no change to the current school calendar for June 18th as all students, elementary, middle, and high are scheduled for adjusted dismissal. So just a reminder, this is just to, to approve adding it to the agenda and any questions can be held off uh, when we get to that point. So are there any other modifications? All right, then hearing none, um, a motion to approve is amended. Mrs. Riggs, a second. Mrs. Hughes. All right, please show approval with raised hand. Madam Chair, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you. 
That leads us now to uh, the superintendent's report, Dr. Spence. Yes, ma'am, and good evening, Madam Chairwoman and members of the board. Here are a few items of interest for you and for our families to know. Uh, first up, last month, Governor and First Lady Northam and the Virginia Council on Women announced the winners of the 10th Annual Virginia Council on Women's STEM also, uh, essay contest. In 2020, the council broadened the competition to include healthcare as the intersection between STEM and healthcare is now more relevant than ever. And in the Eastern Virginia Hampton Roads region, there were two winners announced, one from Lansdowne High School's Governor's STEM Academy. So we're proud to recognize senior Elisa Miller. Elisa joins only nine other students across the state as winners in this contest. And this year, nearly 100 young women from across the Commonwealth in their junior or senior years of high school submitted essays focused on their vision for a future STEM career. Elisa submitted an essay about her motivation to pursue a STEM career and her focus on sealing the rift between modern first world countries and less developed third world countries, effectively creating a better and more connected world. For her win, she's received a merit scholarship and will soon be a class of 2021 honors graduate planning to pursue a computer engineering degree at Georgia Tech. So congratulations to Elisa for an outstanding job. We know you're gonna accomplish amazing things in your future. Tomorrow, uh, May the 12th, we will be celebrating National School Nurse Day. The National Association of School Nurses encourages this special day to be set aside to recognize school nurses and appreciate the role they play in the educational setting. And of course, our nurses play an integral role in bridging health and education in our schools. And as you all know, the dedication shown by our nurses wholeheartedly aids in every child's cognitive, physical, and social and emotional development. This year, of course, our nurses have gone above and beyond as they've met the needs of students and staff in this pandemic, all while also serving as critical health hubs for students' complex conditions and urgent medical needs and health information. So I know you'll join me in extending a huge thank you to all of our school nurses for the tremendous job they've done this year for our students, staff, and the entire division. I know I'm confidently speaking for everyone when I say thank you, and I know the board will be recognizing them with a resolution later this evening. Three, I don't know if you knew this, but the division offers a Partners in Education program. <laughs> this is an amazing program that supports collaborative efforts between schools in our community that promote academic success and personal growth for the division students. In our community, businesses, military commands, faith-based groups, and civic organizations work with our schools to offer expertise, resources, and support. This program enriches curriculum and enhances learning experiences while improving the connection between schools and our community, and to date, VB Schools has 985 partners. Community engagement not only makes a positive impact on education by offering real-world applications to learning, but it also demonstrates that our community values education. To learn more about the program, please visit our virtual partnership expo that's happening now at this website on screen, 2021vbpartnershipexpo.weebly.com or you can contact our Office of Family and Community Engagement at 757-263-1821. And finally, the last information session focusing on VBCPS student educational options for next school year will take place over Zoom to, uh, at 6 p.m. on May the 13th. This hour-long session will include both elementary and secondary information and will host panelists from the division who will be there to answer parent questions about both virtual Virginia and the face-to-face -face school session. So that's Thursday the 13th. The link to register can be found by visiting our website, vbschools.com. And as a reminder to parents, please fill out the 2021-2022 school year pre-enrollment survey, which can be access, accessed through the ParentView mobile app or through the ParentView website. Additional information and instructions about how to do that can be found by visiting vbcpssupport.com and clicking the tab labeled for parents. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. That concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Spence. Okay, approval of meeting minutes. These are the April 27th, 2021 regular school board meeting minutes. Uh, one modification that I would like to note uh, to add the school board members who attended the formal 
meeting uh, via Zoom inadvertently left off the minutes. And that includes Mrs. Mrs. Holtz, who was in the school admin building at the time for health reasons, Mrs. Manning, who participated from home for health reasons, and Ms. Anderson, who was out of state due to family concern. So any other mod mod modifications? All right, a motion to approve. Mrs. Hughes, a second. Mrs. Weems. Okay, please show your approval with raised hand. Madam Chair, we have a unanimous vote. Okay, thank you. Now we are, uh, we'll be hearing of citizens and delegations on agenda items. The school board will now hear comments on agenda items from citizens and delegations who signed up with the school board clerk prior to this meeting. In-person speakers will be called first, followed by speakers participating through Zoom or telephone. Speakers should begin speaking once their name is called. As a reminder, each speaker has four minutes to present and will be given a 30 second warning before time expires. Once that time has expired, the speaker is asked to stop their remarks and, and the next speaker will be queued to speak. In-person speakers are asked to keep their masks securely fitted during their time in the school administration building and while addressing the school board. Speakers not able to do so will be accommodated through the use of electronic means in the lobby area. Please keep in mind the school board invites the public to also submit comments through our group email account, which can be found on our website. So, Madam Clerk, would you please introduce our first speaker of the evening? Thank you, Madam Chair. Our first speaker is Annie Speckhart. Welcome. Um, my name is Annie Speckhart, and I am here tonight to object to the use of proposed collective bargaining. Further, I object to any members of the school board who are also members of the union voting on collective bargaining. They should recuse themselves. That is a conflict of interest from this process completely. Um, I object to the use of any funds being used on a study for collective bargaining. I think now, right now, in the climate we live in, we need to be spending our money on more important things. We have children who are in fear right now. Um, they're living in fear. I mean, my gosh, we're making them wear masks while they're in school and out of school. So, I mean, I think we should maybe spend this money on, um, I don't know, some classes that maybe teach uh, non-fear or whatever. But I just object to that. Also, I have a question because I was signed up um, for, um, I signed up for this, and then I actually have two things. I was strongly felt about the collective bargaining. But I also wanted to talk about a non-agenda item, and, I, and I'll be really quick. I don't know if I can do that here. Um, I, I wasn't even going to come tonight because I really wanted to do the um, non-agenda, but I got stuck in all kinds of traffic. And please, if you could just give me like 30 seconds. Uh, or are you planning to go home from here where you could zoom yeah, in live, for that part? Um, yeah, I, I just mean, so but I'm that not we signed can, up for it. I'm signed up for uh, this. I, I, I think I'd rather do it that way. Why? to keep it consistent so that we stick to agenda but items I, during this session. But I'm not on the agenda for non. I mean, I'm right here mm. in person. I drove 30 minutes to get here, yeah, please. I, I run two businesses. This is important. Can you finish these remarks first and we'll see I'm where we're at with that. Okay. I just got stuck in all kinds of traffic. I drove, <laughs> I'm here, I'm present. Let, please let me speak. I think I'm just going to ask you to zoom in when you are, are I'm not back on home. the agenda. We'll add you to that. Please do. I just this so is that we agenda. don't take. I just don't want to set any precedent here. Okay. Okay. Please Thank understand. You. Thank you. Our next speaker is William Curtis. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Good evening. It's uh, my first time addressing this body, and uh, it's a pleasure. 
Uh, I am Bill Curtis, and uh, just a little background, I'm active in the community. I'm a member of the Hampton Rose Black Caucus Board of Directors. I am chairman of the Board of Directors of Stop Incorporated, and I'm also chairman of the Republican Party of Virginia Beach, and I'm here in that capacity this evening. Uh, and I am addressing the issue of collective bargaining. Uh, we had our monthly meeting last night, and there was a unanimous uh, motion uh, approved to have me come and address the issue of collective bargaining, and that's why I'm here. Uh, I've been a member of uh, Virginia Beach's uh, uh, you know, environment here for the past, uh, what, 25 years. Two kids have gone through school here. My daughter graduated from Kellum, and my son graduated from uh, First Colonial and the Illegal Academy. So I'm very familiar with the school system, always been very happy, very pleased with the, the products. My kids, of course, young adults now, but uh, I have a concern about collective bargaining because I do understand contracts, I understand unions, and I understand the need to look out for our educators. Most of my family, all educators. Uh, so uh, I do have a sensitivity to that. Uh, I believe that collective bargaining will add uh, an element of insensitivity to the relationship between the educators and our kids. It becomes a contractual issue rather than one of love and nurturing and compassion because teachers then will have a list of things they can and cannot do or will not do and it will be enforced because it's a contractual agreement. I don't view my kids' relationship with their teachers as a contractual agreement. I look at you here, I see the superintendent, I look at the Board of Education here, I certainly think, uh, and of course the uh, other groups, the unions and support, I certainly think that you can look out for the requirements, the needs of all educators in Virginia Beach. You don't need to introduce a third party that is uh, foreign to what we are focused on here. And not only that, it's going to put a wedge in the relationships between the board, the superintendent and his staff, and, 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 and the educators. So we're in opposition to any form of collective bargaining because we don't think it's necessary. We have confidence in your abilities to work with the teachers and the school, and the, uh, the school system and the superintendent to look out for the needs of not only the educators, but all the other people associated with uh, educating our kids. So we're in opposition to that, and we ask that you not proceed with this matter. I recognize that the state has allowed us to do so, but just because you can do so doesn't mean you should do so. Sometimes it doesn't make much difference, but sometimes it does. In this case, it does. Uh, just because other school boards around the state are doing it doesn't mean that we need to follow them unless there is some specific reason. I had no idea that the teachers, the educators in Virginia Beach were so unhappy with their circumstances or their roles that they are now pursuing collective bargaining. Uh, so on behalf of the Republican Party of Virginia Beach and, and many, many of those members are educators or affiliated with the uh, school system, uh, we stand in opposition to any initiatives that you may be undertaking in support of collective bargaining. Thank you for your time, I appreciate it. Our next speaker is Virginia Wassenberg. Welcome. Good evening. I'm here to speak on the collective bargaining resolution. Um, I read the resolution and I uh, saw that this resolution states that due to the COVID-19 pandemic, this body has not had, quote, sufficient time to, quote, examine and explore collective bargaining. So I thought I'd help you out for a moment and give you the Merriam-Webster definition it defines collective bargaining as the ne negotiation between an employer and a labor union, usually on wages, hours, and working conditions. And that took me about a minute to do today, to look up that definition. Um, but I'm here at, as a Republican tonight. I'm here as a member, a proud member, of the Republican Party of Virginia Beach. And as such, I understand that governmental policy must never interfere with an individual's right to freely negotiate, 
the monetary value of their God-given knowledge, skills, and abilities within an organization. In other words, I'm here to fully support the right to work in Virginia Beach City Public Schools. Now, while I support that, I want you to really understand my position on this topic tonight. You see, I know firsthand about the argument that's in favor of collective bargaining. Because I have family members that are public school teachers in Chicago, Illinois, and they are members of the Chicago Teachers Union, and they support collective bargaining. And we have had, I, love, I just have to say, I love them very, very much, and I have great respect for them. And I have great respect for what it is that they consider important in their lives. And so we have had many conversations surrounding how they support collective bargaining and why. And I want you to understand that I get it. Even though I support right to work, I get it. I understand why someone would support collective bargaining. And I understand why my family members stand in picket lines on strike when it comes to their salaries as teachers in Chicago, Illinois. But I also want you to understand that this is not Chicago, Illinois. This is Virginia Beach, Virginia. And right to work has long governed and guided our great commonwealth. And it has done so with incredible success. And the General Assembly obviously saw that success in 2020 when they ruled to allow localities to retain right to work. So that's what the discussion is here. Should you retain it or should you not? Well, our Commonwealth in the city of Virginia Beach has a rich, full, and long-standing, respectful history that proves the worthiness and the value of right to work. So there really is not a productive standing beyond dog whistle politics for this board to approve the issuance of a blank check to examine and explore a policy that's been so thoroughly vetted historically. So please do not vote to defer to study this issue. Please join members of this body in support of Victoria Manning's substitute motion and prohibit collective bargaining in Virginia Beach Public Schools. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sarah Gerloff and she will be speaking to you from the lobby. Can I see? Can I go? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. First off, I would like to thank those of you on the school board who actually take their oath to serve the people seriously. I'm opposing the resolution that would permit Aaron Spence and or the city attorney to hire consultants or acquire services to study or develop collective bargaining or related services. First, there has been no amount of money set in this resolution for spending. So there's, they haven't set a dollar amount. This means thousands of taxpayer dollars being wasted on a study instead of being spent on our schools on our children. Second, collective bargaining does not benefit children and it takes away parents' rights. It puts the union and employees first. I thought Virginia Beach City Public Schools motto was students first. Collective bargaining drives up costs and diverts resources away from classrooms to be spent on attorneys and administration to manage this beast. Third, collective bargaining does not benefit teachers as unions seek to monopolize bargaining privileges, depriving workers of the right to negotiate their own employment terms and conditions. It does not help or represent the majority of the teachers. I think we should focus instead on the real problem here. That is excessive spending on administration. Aaron Spence has paid over $250,000 as the superintendent. This is the same guy who accepted money from the Virginia Beach City Public Schools and ERDI to attend conferences. That is, that is known as double dipping and is prohibited by state law. 
This is the same man you are proposing to be put in charge of an undefined budget to study collective bargaining. I am calling for you as elected representatives to demand Aaron Spence resigns immediately for violating state laws and his employment contract. You have all sworn an oath to uphold the constitution and serve the people. I have copies of these oaths. Um, I have repeatedly emailed Beverly Anderson, Sharon Felton, Kimberly Melnick, Carolyn Rye and Jessica Owen requesting to meet with each of them each time I was directed to or contacted by Kamala Linetti, your attorney instead. As an elected representative, you serve the people. I um, am the people, but you have continued to treat me like a Okay, Madam Chair, we're moving on to our online speakers. Our first speaker is F. Vincent Vernuccio. Please unmute. Welcome. <laughs> Vincent Vernuccio, please unmute. Thank you, and uh, members of the board, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify here today. My name is Vincent Vernuccio, and I am a senior fellow at Virginia Works. And I'm also a visiting fellow at the Thomas Jefferson Institute. Um, I once again appreciate the ability or the opportunity to opine here on collective bargaining. As you all know, uh, collective bargaining was illegal in Virginia for the public sector since 1977. Only as of May 1st could localities choose to allow collective bargaining for public employees. Uh, however, simply defining collective bargaining is not that simple. One of the things that we have to look to is what is the infrastructure necessary to allow public sector collective bargaining or to allow collective bargaining for school employees and for teachers. Um, unlike other states, Virginia has no state rubric of laws, of code, or even administration to carry out collective bargaining to even run elections for unions, for workers, for school employees who may want to join or elect a union. So Virginia Beach is going to have to create all of this if they allow collective bargaining. And the school board, you may have to um, foot the expense for creating this entire administration if you allow collective bargaining. Fairfax County is forecasting a combined 1.6 million for administration costs surrounding collective bargaining for the county and the school district. Loudoun County proposed almost $1 million for their 2022 vote, uh, for their 2022 budget, just for increased staffing. Um, the school board in Loudoun, their budget ranges from two million and nine new FTEs to three million and 13 new FTEs simply to administer collective bargaining. This is millions of dollars that could be spent on teacher raises. It could be spent on COVID safety protocols. It could be spent on taxpayer relief. Yet Virginia Beach is going to have to spend this money simply to administer collective bargaining before a single teacher, a single school employee sees any benefit. So it's right to at least study the issue. Now, unfortunately, the way the state law is written, you may have to vote no and vote no and vote no again. The current resolution simply says that that vote will be delayed. But there could be a petition where employees come back and say, or unions come back and say, we want to bargain and you would have to vote no yet again and vote no simply to save that money and not have to engage in the rubric of collective bargaining to allow unions to get in between hardworking teachers and you, the school board and the superintendent and their employers. Because that's what collective bargaining does. It has a union getting in between an employee and their employer. It's something for the public sector that hasn't happened since 1977. 
So I know there's two resolutions on the table today. Both are good. Uh, the straight up prohibition would send a clear message. The delay would send another message. But at the end of the day, when unions come back and say, recognize us, the Virginia Beach School Board does have that opportunity to say no. That is codified in state law. That is why in Richmond, they gave you the power to choose whether or not to allow a union to come between employees and employers and gave you the choice to spend millions and millions. With an email search. Put your remarks. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kaylee Prouse. Please unmute. Kaylee Pru, and I'm speaking on behalf of myself being a Virginia Beach resident and a pre-law student at Regent University. I'm originally from Rhode Island where unions are ever present and unfruitful. My family is following me by moving down here and my younger sister will be joining the Virginia Beach school system. I'm also speaking to represent the young adults of Virginia Beach who are growing into the next generation of leadership that will sit in the places you are sitting in the upcoming years. I want to bring the topic of collective bargaining to the school board's attention. Mandatory public collective bargaining should not be passed. Opposing this union does not take the rights away from our teachers. Rather, allowing a union, it gives the avenue to a third party to create a barrier between employers and employees. The direct relationship with an employer will be lost and could lead into oppression against teachers. For example, teachers may begin having trouble seeking personal flexibility in scheduling for life situations. If a union is enacted, Virginia law does not set much in concern with the parameters in which a union may work. Therefore, the union may not look like what may be promised to you. The unions have free range to do what they want. Therefore, putting workers and specific positions in jeopardy. Furthermore, this leads to a lack of transparency and accountability within the union as there is a lack of this governing regulation. The union comes in like a shark. Yes, like a shark, monopolizing itself and becoming another bureaucracy. We don't need it. Forced negotiations or collective bargaining will not only negative in, negatively impact the school, but also the taxpayer. It must be realized that these tax dollars are not directly going to our teachers, but they're going to an administration to bring about this collective bargaining. But truly, it's upping the cost of governance without a real tangible gain. Tax dollars will be put towards the special interest of the union to dictate school calendars and disciplines for employees when they don't even personally work there. Teachers are role models for society. They are respected, strong and adaptable, especially as school is now taught through Zooms at times. They are motivators, cultivators of knowledge, but they deserve the best. I encourage you to realize that not everything a union says is promised and the best for you must be pondered and should not rest in an outside entity. Be empowered. You have the educational background to know the importance of self-advocacy. Be that example for your students. Know that your employer, you know your relationship with them, along with the relationship with your coworkers. There should be no need for a random third party jumping in who has no personal relationship with you or your coworkers. The union will view you as a number on a page. It isn't even socially acceptable to call a child by a number on the attendance sheet, am I right? I encourage you, the School Board of Virginia Beach, to uphold clarity and judgment as ultimately this is your choice. And what you're propositioning may not seem like a big deal. Unions may not seem that bad, but if this policy is passed, what will come next? The want for more. Well, what more? Separate pensions a separate school tax for communities to pay, a lack of competition in the workplace. We have a school system that is not broken, but in fact, one of the best in our state. We do not need to fix what is not broken. Ultimately, where unions are allowed, freedom will be tainted. Do not fall into the deception of a union. Thank you for your attention. Our next speaker is Jeff Pong. Please unmute. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair Rye, Vice Chair Melnick, 
members of the School Board of Virginia Beach and Dr. Spence. My name is Jeff Cobb, a retired Virginia Beach teacher, and I am a proud VBEA member, as well as a past member of the meet and confer process, which these days might further serve as carbon dating myself. I speak to share my concern about the proposed resolution 12B, the purpose of which seems to be to delay consideration of collective bargaining for Virginia Beach employees and their groups. It seems to me that this resolution is more about prejudging the worthiness of collective bargaining for teachers and others than it is about addressing time constraints. There are, of course, passionate arguments on both sides of this question, but I will leave these mostly for another time. As part of its rationale or whereas, the proposed resolution cites the time demands of working through the pandemic. While teachers and staff respect that the board administration have in fact expended considerable energy and time in this regard, the reaction of most teachers and other employees must be, welcome to our world. Employees have been tasked to produce even more over time than usual. This doesn't seem like an inconsistent request of division leadership. And again, we are mindful that you are also quite busy. Further, the collective bargaining language passed this spring and signed into law by the governor allows the school board up to 120 days to consider and decide upon a resolution to hopefully approve collective bargaining upon receipt of certification of a majority of employees, regardless of association membership status within one or more employee units. We believe this represents enough time for proper consideration of this important issue. The last time that Virginia Beach participated in a program similar to collective bargaining called Be to Confer, staff, administrators, and the school board all played a professional, cooperative, and positive role in developing and approving programs such as a certified nurse in every school, a first in Virginia at the time and the career teacher program that then provided a realistic incentive for teachers to enhance their skills to the benefit of students and receive a stipend that encouraged retention of skilled staff at the beach. Among today's challenges are the safety of our students, the best strategies to meet varied student needs, and the support necessary to help reverse the growing shortage of qualified employees who care for our children directly and indirectly. Please let us not take action tonight that will either delay or prevent more such positive discussions and developments for our students, staff, the division, or our community. Thank you again for your time and consideration. Our next speaker is Diana Howard. Please unmute. Um. Hi, my name is Diana Howard and I am the chair of the Virginia Beach Tea Party. And I would like to support the resolution for you not to do collective bargaining for public employees. Public services, such as policing the streets and putting out fires gives government a monopoly. Even though the bill that created this does not allow public employees to strike now, how long will it be before they do? Didn't the trash workers strike without consequences for a bonus? Isn't the, didn't the VBEA do that by advocating for a vaccine for themselves and refusing to return to in-person schools? H. Reskin wrote in 1968, the community cannot tolerate the notion that it is defenseless at the hands of organized workers to whom it has entrusted responsibilities for essential services. Collective bargaining with public employee unions would mean taking some of the decision-making authority over government functions away from the people's elective representatives and transferring it to union officials with whom the public has vested no such authority. Collective bargaining laws have led to more public employees joining a union and through the union's political activity, unions help elect the very politicians who will act as management in their negotiation contracts. In effect, handpicking those who will sit across the bargaining table from them in a way that workers in a private corporation cannot. Unions work to exert control over the very governments that employ their members. 
The private sector has to compete in the marketplace, has to keep costs down. The public se sector keeps growing and hiring more and more people using their power to demand more public services. Unions use dues for political contributions, which will surely get this legislation changed in their favor. So our tax revenue will be paying for their lobbying for more of our tax dollars. Increasing pay and benefits like lifetime health insurance, pensions that already are unfunded pension liabilities. In the private sector, an employee has to contribute to both healthcare and, and retirement plan. Wall Street Journal put it recently, public sector unions may be the single biggest problem for the union econ US economy. Please vote no on public uh, collective bargaining for public employees. Thank you. Next speaker is Vic Nichols. Please unmute. Welcome. Thank you. In the first place regarding bargaining, I'm, I'm sorry, but it needs to be voted down. The fact is in just a couple of meetings, um, I do not see that some people are going to be capable of using that power responsible, responsibly. Um, teachers have basically in the past year have hurt minorities. Um, In-person class time is very important for them. It's been shown that way. And the teachers refusing who have refused to come back when it has been proven schools are one of the most safest places there are. You're only hurting minorities and, and I have a problem with that. You also hurt women. I've got multiple articles that indicate women having to stay home because of child care for the kids and education. Have been the topic is collective bargaining. Correct, ma'am. But this also goes towards collective bargaining because the people who are going to be deciding collective bargaining really shouldn't be in that position. All it's going to do is cost money. The actions that have been made by teachers groups have hurt minorities, women. There's been cat fights on here. And the fact is, is that the people who are going to be involved in that collective bargaining are on the school board. And I find that very concerning as to how their actions are and then to give them power over that. Ms. Holtz, you indicated that um, teachers should dictate how they work to their clients. Maybe you can tell me what successful business dictates to their clients like that. You see, the auto workers became a union and ended up requesting so much that they destroyed that line of work in America. Teachers really need to understand that students and families are the ones who dictate things, not the teachers. How long you work and things like that are depending on what it takes to get the kids educated. All of those types of things figure into collective bargaining because it's so much more than money. It is about control. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dawn Uman. Please unmute. Welcome. Good evening, Chairwoman Rye, Vice Chair Melnick, Dr. Spence, and members of the board. My name is Dawn Uman. I'm a high school math teacher and secretary of the Virginia Beach Education Association. I come before you tonight to address agenda item 12B. I urge you to vote no to the current resolution and to any other resolution that thwarts the efforts of collective bargaining. Last week was Teacher Appreciation Week, and the fact that the resolution concerning collective bargaining was published late last week is all too ironic. How are teachers supposed to believe that they are truly valued and appreciated by leadership and this board when this resolution is sheer betrayal? Every good relationship is built on trust, respect, and communication. Time and time again, I have heard leadership talk about the importance of relationships, yet this resolution says differently. Teachers are asked to not think of an us and them paradigm we are asked to not refer to the people in this building as downtown, but to refer to them as central office support. How can you support your employees if you don't know what they need? How do you know what your employees need if you don't let them have a seat at the table and talk? 
How can you meet the goals of the division strategic plan if you won't engage with your employees in a meaningful manner? Goal four of the Compass to 2025 is an exemplary diversified workforce. And goal six is organizational effectiveness and efficiency. If these are truly goals and not empty words, you need to include your employees in the conversations. The working conditions of your employees are the learning conditions of our students. Change is difficult, change is necessary, and it's, it's possible with trust, respect, and communication. Change does not have to happen in a vacuum and is easier when all stakeholders are involved. Together, we have navigated the challenges of educating during COVID, and together we can navigate collective bargaining. Collective bargaining does not have to be scary. Learn more about it and make informed decisions. Any resolution that thwarts the efforts to allow employees to collectively bargain is bad for everyone. Such a resolution sends a message to employees that they are not valued and that their voice does not matter. I urge you to demonstrate last week's words of appreciation with real action tonight. Vote no for the resolution and vote no for any other resolution that closes the door on communication and collective bargaining. It is time to restore trust, respect, and communication. It is time to build relationships, not dismantle them. It is time to work together so we have a division where employees are truly proud and happy to teach at the beach. And it is time to provide our students with the best learning conditions ever. Leadership requires courage and change requires an open mind. Be a leader tonight, have the courage to vote no to the resolutions that close the door or thwart collective bargaining and open your mind to informed change based on communication, trust and respect. Thank you. Our next speaker is Peter Ayaya. Please unmute. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, um, Chairperson Rye for keeping things on track tonight. I really do appreciate that. Unfortunately, things tend to get off the rail and, and become ugly. And um, again, I'm not taking a side either way. I just appreciate you keeping things on track. Um, I am going to talk about collective bargaining and a, and a couple of things that were brought up tonight were um, trash workers. I don't know who that is. I think they meant sanitation. Um, those are those workers that they that I think they meant. Um, but then in terms of also asking why um, organizations like VBEA and others asked for, um, you know, for what we were asking for with the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting a little flustered now because I'm just really, really hurt by some of the things that have been said tonight. Um, but why we would ask to be able to get our first responders and frontline workers to get their vaccines quicker was so that we could continue to be that tip of the spear that everyone expects us to be and quote, get back to work to help our community to get back to whatever you want to call normal. But, you know, moving on, um, you know, this, this is something that we're looking for in order to just have a seat at the table. You know, everybody keeps talking about how, you know, we're looking to take control. No one's looking to take control, whether it's a union or, a, or an education association or whatever. All we're looking for is a seat at the table, just to have discussions. Everybody talks about how this is going to take over and it's gonna change everything. We're asking for you to look into collective bargaining so that it can be regulated. We're not asking that it just go off the rail and that teachers get to say everything. And by the way, can we stop just calling it teachers? We're staff. We're all a part of VBCPS. It's not just teachers. So stop saying teachers, okay? It's staff and all staff want a seat at the table. Everybody wants to be able to talk about their future. And that's what this is about. I believe it's incredibly short-sighted to say that these things are more, you know, that there are things more important than the idea of collective bargaining and that, you know, there are things that matter more. I don't understand when we're gonna stop saying that teachers don't matter by saying things like students first, right? We continue to use this tag and it's unfortunate to students that we continue using this tag of students first to dignify or justify teachers and staff last, you know, and, and that's really the big issue here. You know, I also heard an er earlier speaker talk about, um, you know, they brought up a great point that it isn't hard to see why this is important to teachers. And I could also appreciate why people like to lean on the history of Virginia to support their arguments. But my issue is that the history is there to teach us how to be better, not to just continue to do the things that we've already been doing and say, well, they've worked this long, so they might as well continue to work. Teachers having a say in their future doesn't seem like a waste of money, nor does it seem like it's something that's unimportant, all right? But again, what it sounds like is that some are still asking me and my uh, coworkers to put my time, my effort, my life 
behind the idea of students first. Students first is overused and simplified term to ask staff members to just shut their mouths. That's really what you're asking me for, okay? Teachers are role models. I just had a conversation with a former student who's in college right now. She's two years into college. She pretty much told me that in the last year, she's lost interest in teaching because of the lack of representation. You guys have no say in anything. I just don't get it. Why would anybody want to do this job? I had a student tell me that. It's disheartening for two reasons. This is my passion, what I love to do. And two, we're going to lose out on a Virginia Beach student who's gone through our system, our awesome system that builds awesome citizens and also brings back teachers to this area to be fantastic and strengthen our division. Please, please, please stop talking about this like it's something where we're just trying to gain control and that it's a, a rolling, uh, you know, a snowball down a hill where we're just gonna take things over. We're just looking for a seat at the table. We're asking for regulation. Our doors are wide open. Our okay. books are wide Thank open. Thank you. Follow up with an email to complete your remarks if you choose. Our next speaker is Joyce Franzisi. Please unmute. My name is Joyce Franzisi, and I'm an ESL teacher in Virginia Beach and a board member of the Virginia Beach Education Association. I am speaking to you tonight about the proposed resolution 12B, which aims to delay any and all discussion or consideration for collective bargaining for Virginia Beach school employees. This resolution is basically telling your school employees that you do not care to listen to them. Is this the message that you intended to send? Yes, collective bargaining is new to Virginia and new to Virginia, Virginia Beach, but the legislation that was passed very clearly allows ample time for any of these discussions to happen. Under this bill, teachers, school staff, and municipal workers are going to have the chance to work with their respective boards to address learning and working conditions in the schools and communities where they serve. This will ultimately benefit students and taxpayers alike. The resolution being put forth tonight reflects greatly on this board. It is stating your unwillingness that you have to even engage with the professionals that you employ. I think that what you are failing to realize is that our working conditions are the students' learning conditions. Are you therefore saying that you cannot and will not do better for the students and staff in the Virginia Beach schools? You need to understand, collective bargaining is not about unreasonable demands. It is about working together to make things the best that they can be. In school divisions where collective bargaining has been in place, many things were improved upon and successfully secured, such as additional reading, art, and music teachers, setting school calendars, fairer discipline policies, smaller class sizes, and additional support personnel for school counselors and nurses, or such as school counselors and nurses. The Virginia Beach Education Association members firmly believe that contract negotiations rights for educators and school employees alike is a win-win for, win for everyone. They lead to the kind of high quality schools that our children deserve. They bring the expertise of professional educators to the forefront and they will help to, get, to keep great educators in our schools. In closing, as was mentioned by a previous speaker, I ask you to consider the different days of appreciation that you celebrate each school year. You do this to show your nurses, teachers assistants, secretaries, administrators, cafeteria workers, and support staff that they are appreciated. Well, a day of appreciation for your employees is quickly diminished by this resolution. We are instead being given the message that our own school board does not think that what we have to say as professionals or anything that we might bring to the table is not important. You are saying that you are unwilling to even participate in these discussions. I ask you to vote no to this or any resolution that precludes discussions about collective bargaining. You are silencing the voices of your employees before they have even had the chance to speak. Thank you for your time and consideration. Our next speaker is Suzanne Soltisak. Please unmute. Welcome. Thank you. I come to speak as a parent and as a community member in support of collective bargaining being approved for school employees. Economists and soci sociologists have postulated about the impending shortage of workers for the United States for over a decade. Called the birth dearth by economists, we are anticipated to hit a point in the next 10 years 
where we will not have enough people joining the workforce to replace the workers that are aging out of it or retiring from it. Prior to the hit of COVID, it had already hit places like Germany and Japan and started hitting certain markets in the US, mostly skilled labor jobs. Then came COVID and we still have yet to see the, and understand the full impact of that. But between losing half a million Americans and the risk to older workers leading many to retire earlier than planned, it is beginning to look like the impact was to speed up that impending labor shortage. And this is just general employment so far, but for educators and service professionals, we need to be even more cognizant as our world becomes ripe for employees to be more selective in what types of jobs and professions they pursue. With the rising cost of secondary education, how many students will want to go over $100,000 in debt for a profession that pays less than 50,000 a year? Looking at the starting salary for a teacher in Virginia Beach, they, they only make about 10,000 more per year than they were paying pr the year prior to go to one of our state colleges. Fewer and fewer people will choose to go into professions like teaching, social work and counseling as the loan payments will limit their ability to dig their way out of debt for a long time. And Mr. Curtis, while I know our educators love their students, love does not pay the bills or the student loans. So all of this adds up to less and less people going into the field of education. This is especially concerning when as a state, Virginia had over a thousand teaching positions unable to be filled each year before COVID started. Then educators started leaving the field in droves and many of the ones I know are calling their friends and telling them how much they love their jobs and inviting them to come make more money and deal with less stress. So how many more will leave will we be able to fill in the coming years and where does that leave our children? So I come to you as a parent and community member imploring you that you must do something about this if Virginia Beach is to be able to continue to serve our children and community. The competition will soon be fierce for educators and we do not want to be behind the curve. I fear that we will have that dearth that we will not be able to dig ourselves out of. I advocate, I advocate for children and always have, but in that I am keenly aware that teachers, counselors, administrators, aides, bus drivers, cafeteria workers, they have our children for a substantial part of the time that they are awake each day. If we are not listening to them and making sure that they have a seat at the table, why would anyone come to work with our children and why would they stay? Any person who loves and advocates for children must recognize that those who care for them and teach them, they are an imperative part of the future of our community and our country. And if we do not allow them a seat at the table to how our schools are run and how to ensure that we get the best educators for our students, it is our children that will suffer. And so I ask you to please support collective bargaining. And with my remaining time, I also share that I am proud of the equity policy and training that has been put in place by Virginia Beach Schools and support that continued implementation. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kelly Walker. Please unmute. Good evening, Chair. Hi, Vice Chair Melnick, Superintendent Spence, and members of the school board. My name is Kelly Walker, and I serve as the president of the VBEA. I am here this evening to comment on the resolution to defer collective bargaining. While members of the VBA appreciate the efforts of the school board to get collective bargaining right in Virginia Beach, we cannot support any resolution that precludes employees from the opportunity to have a seat at the table. Therefore, we submit the following statement to you and the public. Virginia Beach Education Association members firmly believe that contract negotiation rights for educators are a win for everyone. They lead to the kind of high quality schools our children deserve. They bring the expertise of professional educators to the forefront and they help keep great educators in our schools. We fought for years to regain the right to have the voices of educators who work with our children every day heard in policymaking. We're not going to surrender those rights before we've even had a chance to see them work. Therefore, we will oppose any resolutions that exclude the voices of Virginia Beach education professionals from the framing of the negotiation process. In our city, we have over 5,000 teachers and hundreds of other educators, including nurses, school counselors, bus drivers, and many others. Why, when one of the most important goals of contract negotiations is the inclusion of their expertise, would you exclude them at the very beginning? Negotiating contracts make students our primary focus. A contract is really a shared set of values we use to create the best learning environment for our students and the best working environment for our educators. Until now, we've lacked an authentic process to identify problems and ensure that commitments are kept. In other states with contract negotiations, educators and school districts have come to agreements that have lowered class sizes, added important positions like counselors and nurses, and provided extra resources for students 
among other benefits. Having education professionals' voices and perspectives at the table is indispensable and helps expand many opportunities for students. When we join together, educators, families, and the community leaders, we can create environments where every student can learn and flourish. This is made much more difficult when the negotiation process is dictated by the school division. In closing, the VBA Board of Directors looks forward to positive, productive, and transparent contract negotiations. Thank you. Our next speaker is Teresa Angel. Please unmute. Welcome. Teresa Angel, please unmute. Let's go on. We'll move on to our next speaker, Stacy Sanford. Please unmute. Good evening. I'm here to speak about collective bargaining. Last month, this board unanimously passed a resolution celebrating Teacher Appreciation Week, which was just last week. This meeting's agenda inc includes resolution recognizing School Nurses Week, which I'm sure will also pass unanimously. We're right in the middle of Police Memorial Week to help spotlight our public safety personnel in the school. And tonight, you recognize certified teachers and leaders. Great sentiments. We should definitely take a moment to recognize the people who impact the lives of our children every day. But beyond the hearts and flowers, tonight this board is also considering a resolution to kick the can down the road on allowing these public service employees to engage in collective bargaining and be recognized by this board. The staff report explains the General Assembly enabled collective bargaining beginning July 1st, 2020, but pandemic concerns overrode the provision's effective date until May 1st, 2021. They didn't mention in their staff report that the new law prohibits strikes by public employees. So the deadline in this resolution is artificial. Pandemic strikes are valid concerns to be sure, but I'm here to question the need for this resolution at all since there's no ordinance or resolution before you allowing collective bargaining. As far as anyone knows, there isn't even a request for certification from the Virginia Beach Education, Education Association, Virginia, Virginia Education Association or any other union looking for a ruling. Even if an application came in, the board would still have 120 days to rule, to rule. This resolution puts off a decision, even allowing or disallowing collective bargaining until July 1st, 2022, and will put off any request to certify citing this very resolution. Good job saying one thing and doing another. Given that Alexandria has already passed an ordinance, maybe you could talk to them. Peek in on Charlottesville, see if their fighter fires have organized, or you can use the Virginia Beach School Boards Association as a resource. They lobbied against the law, I'm not content to put off tomorrow what you can do today. Several members of this board are going to just straight up deny collective bargaining. I urge you to uh, oppose that as well. So in closing, um, please oppose both items when they come up for a vote. Our next speaker is Jean Baker. Please unmute. Welcome. Hi, I am Jeannie Baker. I am a graduate of Virginia Beach Public Schools. My kids are, and I have grandchildren in Virginia Beach Public Schools. Therefore, I am invested in quality public education. I am here to discuss the resolution to defer a decision concerning new collective bargaining law. Teachers labor unions wield a lot of power. The National Education Association and the American Federation of Teachers are in the top 30 most powerful unions in the country. We don't need that kind of control over our public school system. Remember for whom teachers laborers unions work. Their client is the teacher, not the student. Unions often create inefficient educational systems in an effort to promote their client, the teacher, not the student. They are powerful. They elect their own bosses and pad their own pockets. They also protect incompetent teachers. Unions, typically oppose teachers pay by performance and seniority is what keeps the teachers jobs. This is absolutely not in the best interest of our children. We should be striving for excellence in education. Teachers unions interfere with excellence in education because that is not their job. 
Their job is to promote who? Their client, the teacher. We are Virginia Beach. We can provide raises and benefits for our teachers much more efficiently on our own than through a union. We can work with our teachers more transparently and productively than the powerful union. Teachers unions are also usually the most powerful force in school board elections. They have a lot of money and they use their power through politics. We see them lobbying at our school board meetings all the time. And because this is public money through taxation, it removes accountability for efficiency. Different than a private labor union, which funds itself from profits, teachers unions funds their goals through our taxes. This is not in our interest. Let's hold our purse strings close and not have our taxpayer money squandered for powerful special interest groups. This brings me to another point. We may have one or three school board members who are also members of the Virginia Beach Education Association, Virginia Education Association, or National Education Association. As in your code of conduct, you should probably abstain from a vote if there is one. Now, if you're a union lover, you're not gonna like hearing this, but when we are trying to put our children's educational needs first, there are better ways than having the monstrous labor union in charge. Virginia Beach has one public charter school, Green Run Collegiate. As of 2018, Green Run Collegiate has 94% math proficiency and 96% reading proficiency rates. That is outstanding. It is 40% male, 60% female, and is 77% minority population. Now that is a winning story for students and taxpayers. Using a teacher's labor union benefits the big wigs in the union the most. This is supposed to be about our children and our teachers. We are more efficient than a union. No one who is putting children first would ever organize schools like this. In closing, we should not be using our taxpayer dollars to bring collective bargaining to our schools. We should not even be funding a study for this. We may have a new Virginia law that says schools can collectively organize. Just because we can does not mean we should. Thank you for your consideration. Um, speaker 14 is not online. Speaker 15 had to cancel. So we're going to go to speaker 16, Daphne Stagg, please unmute. Welcome. Did I do it okay? My first time. You can you speak, Ms. Stagg. Ms. Stagg, are you with us? All right, the Madam Clerk is on. Oh, is that it? That's it for. That was our last speaker. For agenda. For right. agenda items. Okay. All right, our consent agenda for this evening, uh, agenda item 11. Uh, the following items are listed. Two resolutions, School Nurse Appreciation Day, Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, general fee schedule for fiscal year 2021-22 and religious exemptions. Uh, could we proceed with the reading of the resolutions before we take a motion to? Okay. School Nurse Appreciation Day. Could you need a second? Oh, a second on the, okay, Mrs. Franklin, okay. School Nurse Appreciation Resolution. Whereas school nurses are individuals in the forefront who work with families, teachers, and administrators to ensure students at Virginia Beach City Public Schools have the safest and healthiest possible environment in which to learn. And whereas good health is essential to the learning process and student achievement. And whereas the goal of every professional school nurse is to help each student reach or maintain an optimum level of wellness. And whereas school nurses provide direct nursing care, provide health screenings and follow-ups, provide health-related programs within the school system, 
provide health counseling, and act as resources to teachers on health education issues. And whereas school nurses serve in the children of Virginia Beach schools with dedication, working diligently to make health a priority for children during their regular school day. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach designates May 12th, 2021 as School Nurse Appreciation Day in Virginia Beach, and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this board, adopted by the school board of the city of Virginia Beach this 11th day of May, 2021. Thank you. Next resolution. Good evening. I'm going to present the Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, May 2021. Whereas the people of the United States join together each May to pay tribute to the contributions of generations of the Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders who have enriched the history of this nation. And whereas the Asian American and Pacific Islander community is an inherently diverse population composed of more than 45 distinct ethnicities and more than 100 language dialects. And whereas it is imperative for the good of our nation that schools continue to build awareness and understanding of the contributions made by Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And whereas celebrating Asian America and Pacific Islander Heritage Month provide the students and school community an opportunity to recognize the achievements, contributions, and history of, and to understand the challenges faced by Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And whereas the school board of the city of Virginia Beach, through its core values and implementation implementation of culturally responsive practices, demonstrate our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion within our school division. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach officially recognizes the month of May as Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, and be it further resolved that the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach encourages all citizens to support and participate in various school activities during Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this board adopted by the school board of the city of Virginia Beach this 11th day of May 2021. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, ap approval of the consent agenda, sh please show a raised hand. We have a unanimous vote. All right, thank you. Uh, action items tonight beginning with 12a personnel report administrative appointments motion to approve mrs melnick a second mrs riggs any discussion okay here hearing or seeing none uh please show your approval with raised hand madam chair we have a unanimous vote Thank you. So, Dr. Spence, uh, please uh, proceed to announce administrative appointments. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. And it's uh, timely and a little bittersweet that the appointment this evening, um, I'd like to recognize Heidi Sawala. Heidi is, uh, has been serving as a nurse in many capacities and for almost 20 years as a school nurse at Pembroke Elementary School. Most recently has been serving as a nursing specialist in health services in the Office of Student Leadership, so working directly with Mary Shaw through this pandemic. As you all know, Mary has announced her retirement. We, we acknowledged that at our last meeting together, and uh, I'm pleased this evening that you've accepted our recommendation from uh, Ms. Sawala to step in as the new coordinator of health services in the Office of Student Leadership, so congratulations to her. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, action item B, resolution to defer a decision concerning new collective bar bargaining law. Uh, motion to approve the resolution to open it up for discussion. Mrs. Riggs, a second. Mrs. Melnick. All right, discussion. from the boat. Oh, she took it down. Okay. Miss, Mrs. Franklin. I'm sorry. Are we going ahead and discussing some of these, these comments? Okay. So I just wanted to address the many 
um, comments that were brought to us tonight, and I thank everybody for their input. And, you know, I, I know that all of our experiences, you know, really create a, an opinion on this, this particular subject. And, you know, of course, we have some teachers that have been past teachers here at Virginia Beach, and I thank all of you for your contribution. And, you know, of course, but my background is budgeting and finance. And so I guess I'm a, I'm a very factual type of person because of that. And so I want to maybe ask Dr. Spence, because I, I'm going to actually take a page from your, from your book, if that's okay, for a minute. And, you, you know, when I ask you questions or I bring, you know, public comments to you, you oftentimes say, give me a specific circumstance, give me a specific. And I guess in this situation, I want to ask you and, you know, and, and weigh in, please, with, with, you know, others as well. But, you know, um, I personally think, especially having come on this board, we have got an excellent division. I'm so proud of this division. I just did the, my, I finished my school tour um, this past Friday, and it's amazing. I'm so proud of what we do here. And, you know, we, we've, got te we, we've got bus driver um, that sit, uh, um, the, the, the people that actually, you know, coordinate the bus drivers. We had, you know, almost 50, 58 bus drivers that called in that day, and they still coordinated all of that. We've got such talent here at Virginia Beach. And, you know, someone made a comment to not fix what isn't broken. I want to know what is so broken that we feel like this is something we've got to um, address. And one of my biggest concerns is listening to both pros and cons is that it opens it up to you're either pro-teacher or you're against teacher. You're either pro-student or you're against student. And sometimes that kind of rhetoric really concerns me because I don't think that all of any of us are either pro teacher or not student. I think we're all pro pro students. I I think, you know, and I think that we're all pro teacher. And it concerns me that the the rhetoric is going to be, you know, all of a sudden now we're, you know, anti teacher, and only pro student or or vice versa. And that kind of discussion does concern me a bit. You know, um. I want to know what, having a seat at the table, Dr. Spence, what kind of opportunities do the staff have right now to discuss any kind of concerns that they have? I, I, I mean, I, I really need facts and specifics about why to them they feel like this is such a dire situation if we do not want to adopt this. Um, you know, what is broken? What is that the situation right now that creates this urgency or this desire to feel like their, their voices are not currently being heard? I think that we all listen and read all of the emails that we're getting right now. And, you know, I want, you know, people are citing working conditions, student, you know, the teacher's working conditions or the student's learning conditions. What does that mean? I mean, does, does that mean teachers will do a lesser job because we don't adopt this? I, I don't believe that. I, I believe that teachers do this because they do have a love for their job. And, you know, we give this, the, the community an opportunity to speak. We give, you know, people on the VBA an opportunity to speak. So I guess I just want to, and also, you know, again, we're not a taxing authority because, so, you know, someone had discussed salaries being a reason that we need to just, you know, to have them at a, a seat at the table, but we don't even have the authority to do that. So I just wanted to ask, why is it that we're hearing this, this feedback that we, that we currently are not doing a good enough job, that they feel like if they don't have a seat at the table, that, that you know, we're going to all of a sudden lose all these teachers? And I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I'm just, I just want to have some examples of why somebody might feel like that, because maybe it, maybe that that's a concern that we need to address. But I want to know what it is that is causing this feeling that we've got to ha adopt this, because our school division is going to go downhill if we don't. 
and, and I guess I'm just I'm trying to ask you, just like you asked me, you know, mm -hmm. can, can we get specific examples from from these parents from, you know, from the community? I, I just want to, you know, I just want to kind of use a page out of your your playbook because, you know, I, I really want to make sure that we've got an opportunity to know if there is a deficit, if there is something that is causing everybody to feel the need because they don't feel like they have a seat right now. And I'm sorry, I didn't need to put you on the spot. Well, no, I mean, you, you, I mean you, it, it, you're directing it at me. I mean, so I'll try to answer one question you asked, which was where do employees have the opportunity to have input? And yeah. Mr. Mira talked about the employee input process that we have that is a formalized process for collecting information from our employees on working conditions and that we provide a overview of that data and a response to the board about things that we've done based on that survey over time. And, uh, you know, that's archived in our in board meetings, but that's something that will normally occur uh, on a every other year cycle. Um, every other year, because the in between years, the year we implement response, right? And um, we also have a teacher assembly where there's a, a, a representative from each building who comes to meetings on a, on a regular basis uh, that I attend and that we solicit input and feedback on certain things. Our last meeting was about professional development, um, for example, but I've talked often in the past about budget and where we are with budget and answered questions about budget at those meetings. That's uh, typically a part of the fall meetings with the teacher assembly. And we do meet on an ongoing basis with leadership from the VBEA. That's something that we established when I arrived just to be able to kind mm -hmm. of address concerns that we hear. Um, with but I can't answer your question about what's what other folks think about what's wrong that would need necessitate a seat at the table through collective bargaining. My presumptive guess would be the thing we hear most about from our teachers association during budget season is compensation. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the key issue we hear the most about. But I can't give you other specifics. So if I was going to wager, I'd, I'd say it might be about compensation issues. Which um, we don't have. I but mean, that's only based on yeah. my kind of okay. no, that's fair, but qualitative analysis yeah. of the comments we hear from the VBEA during budget yeah. season. So, I, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm going to apologize to the rest of the board because, again, I'm still new, but I, and I haven't had you know many, many years of all this feedback. But I'm just trying to figure out what it is um, that is so wrong, I guess, right now with the current system as is. We have a board that you know, we have election cycles; people vote. And we've got plenty of teachers on here. People, you know, are voting to, you know, encourage, te you know, teacher support. You know, I th and I'm, I'm, I, and I guess I just don't understand what is what is currently broken. Maybe that's the best way to say it. I don't understand what, and, you know, you know, as a former teacher, please tell me, you know, or you know, I, I, I'm just I'm asking. I'm asking for for feedback. Um, well, maybe other colleagues will weigh in as we go forward. Ms. Ms. Owens? Thank you. Um, I guess I'll start by kind of weighing in my thoughts um, from Ms. Franklin's uh, comments. I think we do have a, a good system in Virginia Beach. It's a city and a school system where people have wanted to move for their children to attend, all of those things as well. Um, just because it's a good system though, doesn't mean for me that there's not a need for all voices to be represented at the table. Um, I joined the board because I didn't feel like I saw my voice at the table. And so I can understand when teachers say, I want a seat at the table, the same way I felt like I would like a seat at the table. It was a great district, moved here, wanted my child to be here, rented so he could attend Virginia Beach schools, but I didn't feel like I had a seat at the table. Okay. And so, sure. And um, I didn't see myself reflected in the board members. I didn't see my racial makeup, my cultural makeup, my age range. I didn't see uh, low income active parenting on the board and I, I wanted a seat at the table and I, I feel that you're going to have the best interactions, whether it's on a school board level, on a 
teacher level, at whatever level you're working with, if everybody has a seat at the table, all uh, involved parties, particularly those who are active participants, having a, a seat at the table. And so I, I think it's important uh, for relationship building. We talk about, um, again, great district, but we know we had issues with uh, where we can improve with special education. One of the things that we hear is parents didn't feel heard. They didn't feel like they had a seat at the table. Um, still a great district, but still something we needed to work on. And so I think that there's many areas in our, in our district that we need to work on bringing people up to have a seat at the table, not being able to see the table, have an active, involved, hearing your voice seat at the table. Um, and so that, I, I do support uh, teachers having a seat at the table. I do also think though that it needs to have the right infrastructure and um, we need to have boundaries as to what that means. Um, and right now we don't have, we don't have anything yet. Uh, last meeting I asked about um, the meet and confer and have we done something like this before and, and we have in Virginia Beach. Um, and they stopped it because apparently it was collective bargaining and it wasn't allowed yet. But to me that means we have been able to do it. It didn't cost millions and millions of dollars. It didn't cost you know hundreds and hundreds of staff members. It was happening. But it was stopped because it was illegal because this hadn't passed yet. This wasn't a, a, a regulation yet. So I do think it's doable. And I do think it can't, we need, we need the infrastructure uh, to be able to do it. We need the boundaries of what everybody's specific roles would be at the table. Because I, I do believe in, in limitations with that. Um, we are elected officials and we're elected to represent in a certain way. But we can still do that and have voices at the table about Yes, about their working conditions. I, we may not have the ability to tax and do things for, for salary, but there's a lot of things that we can bring to the table and have discussions about um, that teachers have talked about. Duty-free lunches being one of the things that came out of previous meet and confer situations. If we can have their voices and input actively being a part, and we have opportunities. If, but if they're not feeling like those opportunities are effective, then they're not effective for those people. Um, we have opportunities right now for parents of special education students or for minority families to, to come and speak and be involved. But if they don't feel that they have the seat in the table, then the methods that we're providing aren't the most effective and we need to look at different ways. Um, so I, I do support some form of collective bargaining, and I think we do need to, to look at how that can happen. When we met last time, I was not expecting for the resolution to come out of the, the session and be put on for action tonight without us having an open session discussion. You know, I understood why we did some closed session and so that we could ask questions that may be attorney privileged. But I think it is important for us to have an open dialogue session and look at the wording um, and, and see what we could agree on and, and not agree on. So I, I am concerned with some of the wording in the current resolution. I, I do think that, there, that we are not ready today um, and that we need the boundaries of what this would look like. I don't know that it would take to 2022 but I don't know that I feel comfortable, all things given, with either of the current resolutions. Um, and so I, I am leaning at this point to voting no to both, but I'm open to coming back to the table with a different resolution that we've worked through as a, as a group, as a board, and come up with wording that has you know, input that we can, the majority of us can work with and, and live with. So that's that's kind of where I am at this point. I, I can't um, support either of the resolutions as, as they are. Mrs. Williams and Mrs. Manning. Yes, thank you. Um, 
Yeah, I was going to comment and ask specifically kind of the same thing that Ms. Franklin said, asked was what opportunities do we already have to, um, to let our employees sit at the table? I keep hearing that term, sit at the table. We can't, well, I don't keep hearing it because I heard it from seven people and I believe five are either former current or past board members of the VBEA. So I'm not hearing it from massive amounts of teachers. But I do think that we um, have a lot of tables and we invite a lot of people to sit at those tables. Um, just the ones that, that Dr. Spence mentioned, the employee input process, teacher forum. We have climate surveys. Um, we have the teacher assembly. Our leadership meets monthly with VBEA. We have calendar committees that we invite people. Even our textbook adoptions, teachers, parents. You know, it's, it's almost every decision we make, we have input. So I think this division, I mean, I've heard it from my colleagues so many times how awesome our division is, how we respect teachers, how we get input, how we have task force and task force and committees where we invite the community, invite our professionals that we employ um, to sit at the table for discussions and we listen to those. Um, I keep hearing about the 30-minute duty-free lunch, and, th and that was great, but while I've been on the board without collective bargaining, I can't even begin to list what we've done. We've lowered class size. We've had, in, we've increased our counselors. We've given raises, this year an outstanding raise. We've reduced mandatory professional development, and we've reduced it again, and we've reduced it again. We've decreased um, professional training. We've increased professional training. We've decreased the number of days in the calendar. And we did it from input. And some of those things I didn't personally want to vote on, but the board changed and it was all because of input, because of so many voices at so many different tables, at so much opportunity. I think this board does value our employees. And I think we do a heck of a job about listening. We give every opportunity to sit at the table. So I do take issue with that. Um, I think that, again, saying students first does not mean we're anti-teacher. Saying that we like our processes of employee input now and we don't want the bureaucracy of collective bargaining does not mean we're against teachers. So I sure hope, I agree with Ms. Franklin, that we don't pull the Newman effect, which I think I talked about this last week, is if you say one thing, it must mean that you feel another thing. Just because I don't want collective bargaining does not mean I don't want employee input. So let's stop that right now. Just, so, just because we say students first doesn't mean we're anti-teacher. We're all up here for students. We're all up here for all of our employees. But I do not think collective bargaining will be a good thing for this division. I think the amount of money it's going to take, the amount of resources it's going to take, the amount of personnel it's going to take is going to be overwhelming. And I think that we have processes in place and we've done a good job. Sure, we can tweak this process. We can, if we want to have a discussion about how to tweak and make the employee input process better, let's have a workshop with John Mira and let's do it. If we want to tweak any of these other things, let's do it. But I do not support having collective bargaining because I think it will be at the detrimental to our, um, to the academic success and, and the professional success of all of our students and our employees. Thank you. Mrs. Manning, followed by Mrs. Hughes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to make a substitute motion. And um, if I may, if I have a second for that motion, if I could also make some comments after that, I would appreciate it. Um, I don't believe the original resolution was read, so I don't know if you want me to read my entire resolution, but um, my substitute motion is that the school board prohibit collective bargaining for school division employees. Second. Madam Chair, for your clarification, the clerk. Mrs. Manning's proposed resolution on the 
boards for you and the public to read. Okay. And I believe Mrs. Hughes has seconded the motion. So please proceed, Mrs. Manning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just would like to address um, some of the concerns that were brought up by the speakers, but also um, you know, reiterate some of the things that um, some of my colleagues have already stated. Um, since I've been on the board, I've advocated for higher pay for teachers that often wasn't supported by some of the same people who do support collective bargaining. Um, just this last year, as examples of things that I have supported for our employees, I brought forth the advocacy for higher teacher stipends for concurrent teaching and supported bonuses for employees during the pandemic. I was also at the forefront advocating for higher pay for bus drivers a couple of years ago, among other financial benefits for employees. I've also advocated for better working conditions, specifically sharing employee concerns regarding student discipline problems and reducing teacher workloads, and I fought hard on those issues. Um, the talking point that if you don't support collective bargaining as as Ms. Franklin and Ms. Weems mentioned, then you don't support employees. It's just incorrect and it's a straw man fallacy. I will never be ashamed of advocating to putting students first. That doesn't mean that I don't also advocate for employees. However, it is our role as elected representatives to make decisions for our students and employees and not unelected unions or employee groups. The Virginia School Boards Association, as I've mentioned in my resolution, stood against this legislation and pointed to the negative impact on student achievement that occurs under collective bargaining. Um, and the last point that uh, makes me, um, that, that causes me to not support collective bargaining is that if we even entertain collective bargaining, it could cost just a million a million dollars just in overhead costs um, to, to have collective bargaining. And so that's just another reason why I don't think that having collective bargaining in our district is beneficial for our taxpayers or for our employees or students. Thank you. Okay, Mrs. Hughes, then Mrs. Anderson. There's others in the queue. I beg your pardon. Yeah, I, I, I'm having a real problem with the Newman effect as well. Um, students are first in schools. It's why the parents are here. It's why the teachers are here. It's why administration is here. Schools are set up to educate students and, and care for their needs. And it's unfortunate that there are people who say, if you're saying students first, then you don't care about teachers, and clearly that is not true. Um, seat at the table has also come to be sort of a, a catchphrase. If you don't agree with collective bargaining, then you don't want someone to have a seat at the table. That's also not true. Um, it, it won't be a majority of teachers at the table. It will be the VBEA who, as we saw from last meeting has a represents a very very small percentage of employees <clears throat> it seems that if they were effective at advocating for their members and all teachers we wouldn't even be having this discussion right now and the only people the only teachers the only employees i'm hearing advocate for collective bargaining are members of this organization I don't hear any other teachers doing that. We have and we have multiple avenues for employee input. In fact, during the times when we were discussing whether or not to open the schools, we actually had teachers, not many, but a couple of them, call administration liars here in a in a public meeting, which is arguably the most inappropriate way to give your input to your employer. And to my knowledge, none of those people have been fired. So I find it very difficult to believe that having um, a civilized conversation with someone and bringing in your input is going to cause a problem with your job. In fact, given all the changes over the last year, I would think everybody would be welcoming any kind of input. You know, people love when you bring them solutions. Um, I also believe that 
entertaining collective bargaining at all is a very, very slippery slope. And it's been brought up, and I asked last meeting if this is something that could shut down the schools, and I was told no. And one of the speakers tonight mentioned that it does not include striking. So it doesn't include striking now. Anything that you see that you don't like, it, it, things got there incrementally. And I really do believe this is one of those incremental things that will, that will lead us to that point. And I think it's a really slippery slope. Um, and the VBSA has advised against it, citing the lower achievement in areas where they have this. I just, this is a bad idea. I, I, I could never, ever be in favor of this. If we had no avenues for employees' input, I could even see where you might entertain that, but this that's just not the case. Everybody who wants to give input is able to give input. And as Ms. Weems pointed out, there are multiple improvements that have been made based on input without collective bargaining. I think this is real dangerous territory to get into, and I just won't be able to support it at all. Okay, no one else be in the queue before we put this up to a vote. I just want to comment that for me, I feel I need more time and more information. And uh, so with that, uh, the motion... The as, motion on the floor is a substitute motion that's on the... Yeah, I was saying the substitute motion, excuse me, that we're looking at on the screen. Uh, that is what is before us for a vote at this time. So please... Let's start with a show of hands approval. Okay. And now show of hands opposed. Excuse me. Dorothy Holtz wants to so know. Would like you to restate what we are opposed to. Your procedure is to read the motion again. Would you? I think she's asking that you reread the resolution. Do you want me to read that? Well, the substitute motion, Mrs. Holtz. Would you like us to read it? There should, there should be, a be a copy in your package, Mrs. Holtz. Um, yes, I do. I'm looking at it right now, but. It's a yes or a no vote, correct? Correct. This is, the, this is a resolution prohibiting collective bargaining, the substitute motion on the floor. It, my, my vote is no, a no vote against this resolution. No. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 <laughs> so we have we Madam have Clerk tabulating. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, Madam Chair, for the substitute motion on the floor, we have four ayes in Ms. Hughes, Ms. Franklin, Ms. Weems, and Ms. Manning. And we have the following um, no's, Ms. Owens, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Melnick, Ms. Rye, Ms. Felton, Ms. Holtz, and Miss Riggs. So the motion did not pass. There were only four ayes and seven nays opposing the opposing the sub motion on the floor. Okay, so that brings us back to the the main resol the resolution on the agenda. So. We'll Madam, Mrs. Madam Chair, she's going to put that on the board for you. So I thought this might be an opportunity to just offer some clarity on what this resolution says, as a, again, to continue further discussion, because this isn't intending to, well, I'll just, I, I'll refer first to uh, Mrs. Linetti's packet from the April 27th school board workshop with the various scenarios 
and one of the considerations was to adopt a resolution to defer a decision on collective bargaining to, to and, and we're saying up to July 1, 2022. So just a reminder of, of what she was, of what this, this resolution is offering up to a year, up to a year, it, it's because we're, we're not ready to, for those who, who feel we're not ready to make a decision, uh, it, it's offering the time to, to, to meet with staff and to get some of this information that we are not privy to right now. Any major decision or initiative, would there would be a cost value attached to it, and we don't have that yet. And resources, and you know, we've generically referenced personnel that would be needed, but this would allow time to gather that information. Uh, Virginia Beach is not an outlier in not being, you know, in in, need, in the need to to seek more information. I, I'm a little concerned or confused right now at some of the comments that this resolution closes the door uh, was one comment. And again, it's, it's offering time, needed time to do, what, to do our due diligence to make a decision that, that has such major ramifications and to investigate the different alternatives. So Mrs. Linetti's slide with, with this option, going back to the workshop, says allows the board to use fiscal year 22 as a, and of course not waiting till July 1 necessarily, but to use it as a planning year or a planning period if that makes people more comfortable. Activities might include, and it mentions possibly creation of an administrative task force to, to gather this information as a starting point. Uh, for us to cont to research into best practices, and Mrs. Linetti and even some speakers mentioned some of these other districts in the state. Meetings with leadership from current employee groups. This is listed as a pos as a possible or potential step in this planning process. And then finally, consultation with subject matter experts and other school divisions and or in the labor, legal or labor relations field. And, and again, that's only if we see fit and anything that involved money would require a, a, a checkpoint and school board approval. But certainly consulting other divisions, there's no monetary factor there. And I know our board attorney is already uh, in, engaged in, in those discussions. Uh, so, I hope that offers some clarity. And with that, um, please let us know who would like to be uh, added in the queue to discuss for the most for the resolution on the floor. All right. Then, hearing no discussion, uh, and we do have the motion and the second originally. Yes. So all in favor, of, well, let me ask this before we ask for a vote. Mrs. Linetti, where would this, where would this leave us if this vote, if this resolution did not pass? And again, the reason I brought it to you at the last meeting was your time period started running on May 1st. And I've been advising you for the better part of a year now, legislative committee advised you last year too, this was coming. As of May 1st, if any, organization puts in a request for certification, you must respond to that. I've given you the law, it's a new package out there, but take a look at it. It's not just yes or no. It's, if you say, if you were to say yes, you also have to have your certification in process in place. That must be attached to the resolution. We discussed at the last meeting what that would involve. You have not made those decisions yet. So. All of that is on the table. So if you do not have um, a resolution one way or the other, if you take a look at Virginia Code 40.1, 57.2, and you have copies in your package, look at, at paragraph C. For any governing body of a county, city, or town, and it's defined earlier that school boards count, that has not adopted an ordinance or resolution providing for collective bargaining, such governing body shall, within 120 days of receiving certification from a majority of public employees in a unit, 
considered by such employers to be appropriate for the purpose of collective bargaining, take a vote to adopt or not adopt an ordinance or resolution to provide for collective bargaining by such em public employees and any other public employees deemed appropriate by the governing body. The final sentence is nothing in the subsection shall require any body to adopt an ordinance or resolution authorizing collective bargaining. So if you do nothing, the time period has already begun. If someone, some unit sticks in a request, you must begin this process. We talked extensively at the last meeting. I've talked over and over again to many of you in the last two weeks. There are a lot of things you have to consider, so that doesn't stop it. So the minute somebody comes in the door, you must begin this process. So that's what's going to happen if you don't have anything on the table. And again, the, the, one of the examples I've given to some of you to explain to you is imagine you had a piece of property that you were never allowed to build on. It's been sitting there and suddenly somebody says to you, you're allowed to build on this property with a couple of restrictions on it. What I'm hearing some of you say is you're picking out the wallpaper and the fixtures. You don't have a pro you don't have a building. You don't have a foundation. That's what we were saying to you last time. You have to build this entire process if that's what you want. And we need some time to do that. So if you don't have anything in place, that 120-day period will start the minute some organization sticks a request in, and you're going to have to start doing that period. That's what we were trying to talk to you about last week, is everything that will have to happen. Deferring was one recommendation, and that's something you could do. But you are still open to that. So you, nothing has stopped that time period running. You need to be prepared to start that process. Now, your could answer could be, we are not going to adopt it, in which case you won't do anything. But if your answer is, we are going to adopt it, all those things we talked about at the last meeting have got to happen. So we still need to plan for that. So I'm not saying you have to adopt this resolution. We talked last time. This is what you wanted to do. Some time periods, some planning, some parameters on it. So again, that's what happens. If you don't adopt the resolution tonight, you're sitting there waiting for subsection C to kick into effect, in which case you will have to start this process. If nobody puts anything in, you're fine. But once something that does it, you have 120 days to start making decisions. So that's where you are if you don't pass the resolution. Uh, Mrs. Hughes, then Ms. Owens. You know, as, as Ms. Linetti pointed out, she's been talking about this for a year. And the can has been getting kicked down the road because the general consensus is nobody wants to deal with it. I say nobody. Most people don't want to deal with it because most people realize this is a bad idea. And so with deferring it and, and studying it, I feel like it's just, I'm wondering how much money we're going to spend studying something and what we're going to cut, where that money is going to be taken from to preserve the optics of we didn't shut the door right away when I actually believe the door is going to end up getting shut on this after we study it because it's a bad idea. And I think most people would acknowledge that if we didn't have cameras rolling. But how much money are we going to spend just for optics and is there going to be any limit on what we can spend studying this? Well, at least to that question, I'd like to point out that the school board has to approve mm -hmm. any of that mm -hmm. because I've heard it said a few times that I'm going to have some kind of blank check to do this for you. So, mm -hmm. Just want to make sure that you would have to approve that, Mrs. Hughes. So that really would be up to the board collective in terms of how much money might need to be spent. And I imagine that would be a conversation we would have just in terms of the expertise needed. There's a lot... I think Cammie can do to get you along uh, further down the road, but neither she nor I nor any of my staff are experts in um, traditional collective bargaining. We do have some expertise in, in meet and confer because it's been done and some of our staff have participated in that process. I just think if somebody's going to vote on something to defer, and there obviously is going to come a price tag with that, there should be some limit. I don't think anybody should have a blank check. Okay, Ms. Owens. I just wanted um, to make sure I had clarification on the uh, subsection C. Uh, if a within 120 days of receiving certification uh, from a 
majority of public employees, we have that uh, clock ticking. At the end of that 120 days, or I assume any time within that 120 days, the board is still able to decline at that point to engage in collective bargaining Correct. because we say we're not ready, we don't have the infrastructure, we still need to get boundaries, we're still doing things, so we can still just just say no. We can still just say no if we're not ready. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So for clarity, I, I know you explained to me, Mrs. Linetti, speaking to that, number two is in there to assure that the same answer would be, it would be neutral. The same answer would be given to every group who in, while until the board is ready such time to, to officially yay or nay. Now, d does that need to be in a resolution? I guess technically not, but this helps assure that at least it would be a consistent answer because this is a generic resolution. And so the idea is that the answers would be generic until such time that the board makes a, a, a more firm decision or, well, makes a decision. And me. I will point out to you in subsection A, again, of 40.1, 57.2, the sentence that says, if you adopt an ordinance authorized in collective bargaining, any such ordinance or resolution shall provide for procedures for the certification and decertification of exclusive bargaining representatives, including reasonable public notice and opportunity for labor organizations to intervene in the process for designating an exclusive representative of a bargaining unit on there. And that's what I talk about. That it's not just an ordinance, yes or no. If you say yes, we have to build that out. And we have that discussion. What do you mean by an employee groups? How many employee groups? What's the process? Do they want certain forms in? Is there a time period? What's your notice period going to be? There is no guidance out there right now in Virginia. You have to build this house before you start furnishing it. And so that's what you're going to have to do if you say yes. If you say no, then we don't have to do anything about it, and we just keep re-looking at it. But if you're going to say yes, 120 days sounds like a long time. It isn't, because you have to get all that in place and start. And we, we talked about those discussions you have to have. You have to decide what you want. We can do it, but you will do nothing else for the next couple of meetings but this. So you need to plan for that. Whatever you're doing, you need to plan for that. Again, not saying one way or the other. I'm just saying... We have this discussion, so think about what you want to do and when you want to do it. So, again, we would like to help you. We can't even tell you what it's going to cost, what time period it is, because you haven't decided what you want yet. Absolutely. I've been raising my hand a couple of times. Well, I, I, know. I looked over. I thought, I thought yeah. I, yeah. I beg your pardon. Absolutely. Ms. Lynette, you speak well to that. And um, I'd just like to say that it, it's... it's um, it's encouraging that our board members now are looking at what the VSBA are saying. They, and they took out <laughs> some of the um, information from the VSBA. It's, it's encouraging that they take that VSBA as a credible organization to quote them. But I will say that they are asking, they didn't quite dispute it, but they're saying that they will help in the process of putting your bargaining twos together and to get in touch with them as well. And it has to be uh, modified to your division. That's what they're saying as well. But um, my intent, my good intent in the last meeting was to put forth a, if you're saying resolution or decision, that I did need time, time to get it together time to be educated to what we are headed into because this has landed in our lap. It wasn't something that we pulled out of the sky. It has landed in our lap from the Virginia Assembly. They put this together and they have regulated things that we have to move forward with really someone with no meat. So we are having to build a foundation from what they have passed. So therefore, we aren't, Ms. Franklin, you, you're correct. We are not a tax, we don't have tax authority, we do not. And what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing, so goes the city council, so goes the city. And we are still, they still have their thumb on our necks of whatever we do. 
But I am a person that likes to be proactive. And if this is going to come from city council from, from one way or another, we should have something or some thought in mind or that we looked at something or that we, we planned something because more than anything else, my colleagues, I do not want to look dysfunctional. At least we should begin, put something together, have a conversation when it comes to that time. Uh, Ms. Linetti, uh, I, I must say, it took time, far be it from me, I would say to, to even sit here to try to, a couple of minutes or hour to put something together, but I do have some reservations about some of the language that's in this resolution that sort of kind of put a stigma on where we are really trying to go. I am not trying to marginalize, or nor am I trying to um, uh, deter uh, our staff, as one individual said, Mr. Peter said, our staff from having a voice. But I thought, or I felt that what I had put forth last school board meeting that I needed time to educate myself on this, whether or not it's an up or down vote. And someone said, well, you're not going to do it anyway. But we need to give the respect to the law that has been passed. We need to give the respect to the concerns that are being put out now. Now, we can speak from where we are about surveys and how much time teacher has to speak. But, but it, it takes some teachers a long time to even come to the realization that I have a voice and I can say something. We, like they said, over 5,000 employees or whatever. It's a lot of them that we haven't even heard that you have not heard from that I have. And I have spoken to multiple of teachers that feel like sometimes things that they want to discuss. They, they just don't feel that they have their power. But with that said, Ms. Lanetti, this resolution does hold some substance, but some of the language in it, especially uh, uh, under the now therefore be resolved that number two, I have a concern with that particular section there. And to try to work it out right now will probably take a more time than we need. But I feel at this point that it need to be um, this resolution, resolution for the sake of um, just being functional need to be we looked at or tweeted before I could even give my sole consent to this. And that this is what the collective bar bargaining is. I'm always one, I need to know what I'm gonna put my signature on. My, that, that's, that's the essence of me. And I want it to be of substantial, something with uh, um, credibility and that holds me accountable. So other than I respect the work that's been put into it and I was taken aback a little bit knowing that it was gonna be on action. I really thought that we were going to get this, be able to look at it, talk about it, and, and tweak it before it was officially done. So other than that, I do stand by we need something in moving forward. I, we do. And you, you stated that. I get that. That's in, that's in the law. This, this, it's in the bill. It's saying that we have to. But I just need to retweak this before I can, I can solely get my full vote on it. Thank you. Mrs. Malnick. Thank you, Mrs. Felton. I agree with you. And I'd just like to add that educating yourself is never a bad thing. And that's the least we can we can do for our 15,000 employees is to educate ourselves so that we can make an informed decision. So to help me before we vote, what what is in this resolution that some of you would like to see out? So or what is missing that you would like to see in to give us the chance to educate ourselves more. Not to not to legis not to re revise it from the dais, but just some some notion so that we have some plan either way moving forward. Mrs. Riggs. Well personally I'd like to defer the vote for now. I don't think we're ready. I think it's um, my understanding was the same as what Ms. Felton said. Last week, I know that we've been talking about this for weeks and even personally, um, that you had, uh, we had asked to have more information and we talked about, uh, yes, go ahead and write a resolution. Let us look at it, discuss it, talk about it. But we were not ready for a vote tonight. 
So I'm just trying to understand. So I'm not ready for that no. because of number two and because of the timeline. So, so do you why. want this resolution to, to show up next time for action or do you want to? I'm not ready for this resolution to show up yet. I think we need to tweak it. I don't think it's ready for where the way it's written. So that's the, my thoughts. All right. So the plan would be to give feedback to Mrs. Linetti following this meeting on suggested revisions. Is Mrs. Anderson. First of all, I never saw this until last night at eight o'clock. And the reason was because um, our SharePoint site was not up. We couldn't bring it up on our SharePoint site. And then I was told, well, you could go to the public. It was, it was posted for the public, but it wasn't posted on our SharePoint site until eight, almost eight o'clock last night, 745. So, uh, you know, I, that's never happened before since I've been on this board. We've always been able to access our SharePoint site on Thursday night. And that, that, I, 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 that's been discussed. Just let me mm -hmm. finish. I know that things happen, and I get it. Things happen, and so it wasn't, uh, I wasn't able to access it. And, and, but because it had never happened before since I've been on this board, I thought something was wrong with my computer. So I went to another computer. And I kept trying, and, I, and finally I called a couple of board members, and they said, well, it's on the public. It, it's posted for the public. And I said, okay. They go, just go to the VBCPS site, and you can get it. I said, okay. So, and then I started doing that, and then, and then all of a sudden it got, you know, it came up that, that our SharePoint site had been, had been fixed. So, but, but the thing of it is is that last night was the first time I saw it. Okay? So I realized that other people had seen it and the only reason I knew that we had it was because we started getting emails from the public about what it was about and and like I said I just I've never had to go to I've never had to go to the public site before to be able to get things that were on our our agenda so um, not that I'm stupid and that that I don't know how to access the public site I just had never that had never happened before and I couldn't figure out why I couldn't get on there through our SharePoint site but so, but, but regardless, you know, we need time to digest things. And I wasn't in a closed session last time, so I wasn't aware that we even directed Ms. Linetti to write a resolution. When I asked about what had happened, I was told that, that we deferred, that we were deferring things. But no one said, oh, well, we, we've asked Ms. Linetti to write a resolution de deferring our uh, for this so 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 I was a little behind the eight ball on this and not quite ready and 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 because of that you know we're not ready to vote on this tonight and and in my opinion there are things written in here that do need to be tweaked um, and I think that we need to have time to send our comments in and and then we need to maybe have a workshop and talk about this particular type of resolution even before we even vote on it. So I'm not ready to vote on this tonight at all, but so that's where I am. Yeah. So I was just trying to ascertain if, if there was the, this, if the intent is to give further feedback for a resolution that would still provide for time to, to get more information on the issue. And I guess I'm hearing yes to that, just this is not this resolution. All right. Madam Chair, so my recommendation you... might be that you go ahead and vote on this or just substitute motion. If you lay it on the table, which is normally what happens, you need to bring it back to the, at the next meeting. It doesn't sound like you're convinced that you're ready to bring it back to the next meeting. So you may want to vote this down or do a substitute motion, uh, something else on this. So. I, I just wouldn't defer it or leave it out there. Oh, no, because... no, no. Okay. All right. All right. So uh, a, sh a show of hands, those in favor of the resolution. So there are no votes in favor of the resolution. Okay. Opposed? Ms. Holtz, how do you vote? I vote no on this resolution. Thank okay. you. 
Madam Chair, we have a, unanim a unanimous vote against the resolution on the floor. All right. So we'll have to determine next steps. But meantime, we have an, the rest of the agenda to get through. Okay. So final action item C was the one, the added item, adding adjusted dismissals for graduation. Uh, motion to approve before discuss, uh, Mrs. Riggs, a second. Mrs. Franklin, any discussion or questions for staff on this? Mrs. Can Franklin. Just, can I just get the, the information again? I'm so sorry. Can it's you just on, oh, oh no, it's that's my script. Okay. I, I'll read I'll, yes, happy I should read it again. It is on the screen. Um Mrs. Oh, Chairwoman okay. Wright. <laughs> Take a moment. Yeah, just real quick, Ms. Franklin, it's to have adjusted dismissal on the 15th, 16th, and 17th. Those are the first three days of graduation. We already have an adjusted dismissal on the 18th. We're asking for a vote because this is part of the school calendar. Ms. Owens. Just for clarification, is the adjusted dismissal is for high school students only? High school students only. Okay. That stays right up That's there. That's what I thought. Yep. Okay. Okay, any other before we, all right then, all in favor, uh, raised hand please. Madam Chair, we have a unanimous vote. Okay, I'm sure staff is very happy to have that <laughs> certified. <laughs> uh, all right, information, uh, policy review committee recommendations. Madam Chair, if I might ask a favor, um, Mrs. Hughes has pointed out to me that you had three speakers that were on for agenda items who have informed her that they were unable to unmute and they've been online. They would like to know if they could be added to your non-agenda item speakers. Is that okay? Acceptable to the board? Mm -hmm. And I'll let Mrs. Um, Toniano work on that. I'm sorry. Good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, School Board Members, and Dr. Spence. I'm Cami Linetti, and on behalf of the Policy Review Committee, we are bringing you two recommendations. These are Bylaw 147, which has to do with public comment at school board meetings, and related Appendix B, which is school board standing rules. Mrs. Manning had brought to your attention, and it's some weeks back now, that we needed to change or reference in some of this, and we were looking at some of the various items, and the issue came up before us, in particular, on public comment. So Bylaw 147 has to do with public comments at school board meetings, and in particular, at this point, we were looking at the difference, how do you define speakers, and you saw an example of that earlier tonight, informal versus formal, and how to clarify that. We thought we could treat Bylaw 147 at the time, and then we realized we were also going to have to, sorry, we were looking at by Appendix B, we were going to treat the language there. We realized we needed to go back to Bylaw 147. We took it back to the Policy Review Committee to look at some of the comments to verify it, and this is now why it's coming back to you. They are related. So Bylaw 147 has to do with public comments. The first talk section is talking with presentation to school boards, and in particular, it's the naming of the different parts of the agenda. And on the, let's see if I can read this, the second sentence on paragraph A says, public comment shall be conducted under the agenda topics, in quotes, hearings of citizens and delegations, and the PRC is recommending the following term, hearings of citizens and delegations on informal meeting and non-agenda items. We just called it non-agenda items before. And the next thing, the next, Quotation, hearings of citizens' delegations on formal agenda items. If you follow down further in the paragraph on the sentence that begins the speaker, speakers shall have the opportunity to speak one at a time on either formal agenda or non-agenda items at each meeting. And for clarification, the PRC is recommending that we add a sentence that reads, school board workshop items are considered informal meeting items to try to clarify that issue. That would be the only recommendation that we would make under Bylaw 147. If you flip over to Appendix B, we also, under this, Appendix B is essentially the outline for your agendas. And so under 10, which is formal meetings, the title would then be changed to Hearings of Citizens and Delegations on Formal Agenda Items, that we added formal. And in that paragraph, we would go ahead and add formal in front of agenda there. 
I mean, there was something we were already moving out of Appendix B, which is to take out the say it, the sentence, citizens must sign it by the end of the day of the meeting, because that is also reflected earlier in the paragraph. If you then go down to Section 14, this is what how we originally got to Appendix B with Mrs. Manning's recommendation that we sit instead of saying committee reports, that the title of the section would be committee organization and board reports, which more accurately reflects what you're referring to. Going down to subsection C, I'm sorry, subsection 16, hearings of citizen delegations on informal meeting and non-agenda items would now read the title and then later on in the sentence it would read, at this time the school board will hear public comment on items germane to the business of school board that are not on the school board's formal agenda for media citizens to sign up to speak with the clerk of the board by the noon of the day of the meeting. Those would be the only recommendations. We wanted to make sure that the bylaw and the appendix be matched and PRC had recommended that we go ahead and define that workshop items are informal meeting items. There was some discussion on larger issues involving speakers. At that time, PRC decided that those kind of discussions were not a good time to bring up, that that was something to be better in a retreat that the whole board would look at. So at this time, rather than discuss all the other issues involved with speakers, they just want to make those recommendation changes so it's clear as to what section you're speaking on in public comments. And those two would match up. So at this time, the PRC's recommendation would be to adopt the amended recommendations for Bylaw 147, public comments at school board meetings, and Appendix B, school board standing rules also adopt that. Mrs. Anderson? Would it be proper or allowed for us to, um, to ask for these these two policy recommendations to be voted on uh, on action uh, where it says vote on remaining action items. Is it allowed? Is, are we allowed to do that? Are we allowed to, to vote on those later this evening? You could make a motion to move that down. You'd have it would require because it's happy to me, it would require the whole board to vote on it, and you would need a super majority vote. You'd need seven, right? Because it'd be two thirds, right? Correct. We need two thirds. Um, well, I, I, I see no reason to wait another two weeks to, to, um, to approve this. So I would like to make a motion for us to go ahead and vote on this when we get to number 19 and, um, as, you know, vote on remaining action items. I realize that we need two thirds to, to vote for that. So, uh, you know, if there's no objection. I'd like to do that. So. So your, if I can clarify, Ms. Anderson, your recommendation would be to take items 13A, 1 and 2, and move them down to further action items 19, 19 um, I mean, and vote on them this evening. Right. I mean, I understand if there's people on the board who don't feel like we should, but I just, I just don't feel like we should wait another Let's just, two weeks to vote on we'll, this. We'll vote. So is there a second? Yeah. Okay. So, so the motion, Mrs. So we're voting show approval if you agree to mrs anderson's motion to add this to the agenda for a vote tonight on agenda item 19 vote on remaining action items did i get that right that would be items 13a one and two we'd vote together if there's no objection as for the action and that would be the motion the alternative is to keep to the schedule right okay so with that is everybody understand what we're voting on whether this motion to vote tonight rather than defer two weeks all right Officially. madam chair before that who did the second thank you miss melnick all right all in favor raised hand please madam chair we have a unanimous vote all right so that's to add so we will get back to that in a bit <laughs> thank you uh that brings us to standing committee reports who would like to start us off mrs weems yes the special education advisory council lovingly known as SEAC, i met monday bobby jameson was the um presenter and he um, talked all about the different diplomas and the different graduating requirements for all our students specifically those who um, are receiving special education services mm -hmm. it was a great discussion a lot of good a lot of good questions and answers and that's it thank you thank you 
Uh, governance, I can report that the board self-evaluation form continues to be developed and should be, but the goal is to have it available for the collective board input um, by the end of May, early June. Again, and, and uh, discussions continue on just how that process will play out at the retreat. What we do know is we have confirmed a retreat location, correct, Dr. Spence? Yes, ma'am. Our new plaza addition, and what is that room referred to as? Well, the no, 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 it's not the new. <clears throat> it's I beg not your pardon. The new addition, correct? Mm -hmm. It's the professional development center that's always been there. It's just uh, been renovated as a part of that project. So, I think the board will enjoy the opportunity to see that new space. That's, I'll just opine for two seconds. That's that's really like a professional development center, and so mm -hmm. we're we're lucky to have it. Yeah. And if you have to drop off your laptop in the meantime, you can take an advanced peek, get an advanced peek like I believe Mrs. Anderson did. Okay, Mrs. Melnick? We had to postpone last month's audit committee meeting, um, but we do have one Thursday, and it's in person, socially distanced. Okay, anybody else? All right, then that concludes our formal meeting, and we need some transition time here as we prepare for our non-agenda speakers.